Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to him, to Jesus, and the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, this fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. And then within this chapter, Jesus goes on to tell the parable of the lost sheep, and then the parable of the lost coin, and then the heart of today's text, the parable of the prodigal and his brother. Jesus said, There was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country, and there he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout the country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him to his field to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare? But here I am dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring out a robe, the best one and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet and get the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his elder son was in the field and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the slaves and asked what was going on. He replied, your brother has come and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has got him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and refused to go in. But his father came out and began to plead with him. But he answered his father, listen, for all these years I have been working like a slave for you and I have never disobeyed your command. Yet you have never given me even a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came back, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. Then the father said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord, we do give thanks to you for these, your words that we find in Scripture. Lord, let our hearts be open so that it's your word that settles there, drawing us closer to you and to your will for our lives. Amen. We are well into the season of Lent at this point. And I hope it's been a season of joy for you, deep joy, a time of prayer and study, perhaps even a time of fasting in one form or another. Those of you who have experienced our 
prayer guides that we've included in our bulletin from week to week. I hope that has been a helpful tool. I hope that it's helped you to explore some new ways of praying and some new encouragement for intentional time to listen for God, to experience God's presence. This week's guide that's toward the back of the bulletin offers the invitation for an eyes wide open prayer using art as a visual focal point. Now you can do this with any form of art or iconography, but included in your bulletin is a small image of a painting by Rembrandt titled The Return of the Prodigal Son. It portrays the family from the reading from our gospel text. It's a moving and compelling scene. Much has been speculated, studied, and written about this story and particularly about this painting. Henry Nouwen first saw this painting in the form of just a poster on a friend's wall and was so drawn to the work that he eventually traveled to the Hermitage Museum in St. Petersburg, Russia, where he was even more mesmerized by the beauty and the imagery within it. And then he wrote a book of the same title, The Return of the Prodigal Son. In the book, Nowen parallels his own spiritual journey and life struggles with his deepening understanding of the gospel text and of Rembrandt's life and his own struggles and of the imagery within this painting. Nowen first saw the painting during a transition period in his own life, and he identified at the time most intensely with the younger son, the prodigal son. And Nowen writes, I had wandered far and wide, met people of all sorts of lifestyles and convictions, and become part of many movements. But at the end of it all, I felt homeless and very tired. When I saw the tender way in which the father touched the shoulders of his young son and held him close to his heart, I felt deeply that I was that lost son and wanted to return as he did, to be embraced as he was. Later, a friend's suggestion that he was more like the older son led Nowen to ponder that possibility. And he writes, I came to see how I had lived quite a dutiful life. When I was six years old, I already wanted to become a priest and never changed my mind. I had never run away from home, never wasted my time and money on sensual pursuits. For my entire life, I had been quite responsible, traditional, and homebound. But with all of that, I may in fact have been just as lost as the younger son. I saw my jealousy my anger, my touchiness, doggedness, and sullenness, and most of all, my subtle self-righteousness. I was the elder son for sure, but just as lost as his younger brother, even though I had stayed home all my life. Finally, a friend challenged now in that, you know, whether you're the younger son or the elder son, you have to realize that you're called to become the father. Well, that's the image and the call he resisted most, and I think perhaps it's true for us as well. I've had my own experiences of wandering from home, uh, leaving my family of origin, even times in my life when I've wandered from my spiritual home in God. I've also had my experiences of being the dutiful and responsible one. In fact, the whole of my life is weighted more in that direction, more towards the role of more of an elder brother. And like him, I've had my moments of resentment and jealousy toward those who seem to get ahead or seem to get more attention, even when they don't quite seem to deserve it. I'm guessing that if you take some time to ponder your own life experiences, you might discover that you have the ability to identify with both, both sons, the wandering son and the responsible homebound son. But what about the father figure? 
The father's welcome and embrace of his son demonstrates God's constant readiness to welcome and embrace us. Again from Nowen, the father's love does not force itself on the beloved. Although he wants to heal us of all our inner darkness, we are still free to make our own choice to stay in the darkness or to step into the light of God's love. God is there. God's light is there. God's forgiveness is there. God's boundless love is there. What is so clear is that God is always there, always ready to give and forgive, absolutely independent of our response. God's love does not depend on our repentance or even our inner or outer change. Well, no wonder it was difficult for Nowen to see himself as the father, that kind of figure. I mean, can any of us imagine loving so selflessly, so unconditionally? Can we ever comprehend the magnitude of God's expansive love? Well, the person I know who has come the closest to that is Celeste Ray. Celeste, God, is big, big, big. <laughs> Celeste has the biggest, deepest, broadest, most illuminating and expansive understanding of God than anyone I've ever known. Her understanding of God is a God of love, unconditional love, and ever-creating love. Now, one of the books that I happen to know Celeste uh, has read and reread a number of times over the past several years uh, is Philip Newell's The Book of Creation, An Introduction to Celtic Spirituality. And in it, Newell reflects on the creation story from Genesis. That's a nice little intersect, right, with our fabulous music from today. Each day explores a different aspect of creation as a manifestation of God, revealing a divine presence at the heart of everyday life. Divine presence in me, divine presence in you, divine presence in every living thing, every animal and tree, every bird and flower, every ocean, stream, and rock. God within us and God among us. That's big. That understanding of God, that big understanding of God, might just break down the barriers, real or imagined, between us. That kind of presence and love might draw us to be more present, attentive, and loving to one another. Even, especially, the others who are difficult to love those who disappoint us, those who wander away, those who for whatever reason we have decided don't really deserve our attention or our love. To claim this big understanding of God, we have to let go of our small view of God. You know, the God we tend to construct more in our own image rather than the other way around. The God we tend to box in and try to contain. Religious life together is very much about deepening our understanding of God. It's about living a life in right relationship with God and in right relationship with one another. But I'm convinced that to really do that means living with this strong and constant tension. This tension between our longing to know and study and understand God better and our constant willingness to let go of our own limited understanding. To let go and let God means to let go completely, trusting that God is present beyond our comprehension knowing that God loves us boundlessly and putting our faith in God, the fullness of God, God our creator, God in Jesus, our redeemer, God in the Holy Spirit, our sustainer and our guide. 
And it means perhaps most of all the willingness to receive the extravagant gift of God's love which then allows us to love a little more like God. So why did Jesus tell these stories of lost things? Lost sheep, lost coin, lost son. Well, if you remember, he was responding to and challenging the religious leaders of the day, inviting them to adopt a more divine point of view, inviting them to receive and to share God's abundant hospitality, inviting them and us to welcome rather than exclude. The gospel text illustrates a father longing for reconciliation, not with just one son, but two sons. The younger son humbled himself to receive the father's love. We don't know about the brother. We don't get the rest of that story. He was invited to the party, but does he accept? I hope so. Will we? Will we return home? Will we cease our wandering, let go of our resentments and jealousies and fears, let go of the box we try to keep God inside of? Receive the gift of God's expansive, unconditional, big, big love? I hope so. Amen.